Good morning. Thank you so much uh, for joining us here at our Global Impact Celebration at Grace. Uh, this is an annual event in which we celebrate all our different uh, ministry partners, both uh, here and around the world. So we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, number one, and then also uh, supporting us in all the different ways that you have. Uh, the only announcement that I have today, uh, other than the, uh, the lunch that's going to be after the service in the CLC, is that... Uh, the Gospel of John Bible study uh, is going to be moved to tomorrow night. Uh, and so um, that, those are the announcements for today. And uh, again, we just thank you and welcome you uh, with a big open heart here to worship this morning. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer as, uh, as we see what God's going to do in our midst. God, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the world that you've given us. Uh, th this is our Father's world. And even though it's, it's uh, separated from you in sin, uh, we thank you for the, the bridge that you made in Jesus. And as many people, uh, whether it be next door or around the world, that we can tell about that bridge uh, or offer a, a cool drink of water to or uh, a new pair of shoes or uh, just some love to help them along this way, uh, we ask that you would give us the power and the strength and uh, the wherewithal to go and do that. Uh, so we lift this time up to you. We lift this morning up to you. Uh, let this be a pep rally in which we are empowered to go out and uh, reach the, the nations for you this morning. So we say this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's join together in the days of Elijah. Let's stand as we sing.
time for us to uh, introduce our ministry partners and our missionaries, and uh, we're so blessed. This has been an incredible weekend, and uh, wow, so many people to thank uh, who have given of themselves, and, and God's timing has been down to the detail, perfect, as always. Uh, we didn't realize till this morning that uh, it was St. Patrick's Day, and, and I, I told Connie, I said, you, you picked out the green for St. Patrick's, right? He said, no, it's our anniversary. No, too. no it just it's, happened. It's an anniversary. It's an anniversary? Wow. And you, you know, wow. Happy anniversary. <laughs> and many have given of themselves, and, and, uh, and she wouldn't want this said, but she has been up here tirelessly serving uh, in, in, in incredible ways and many others, Dylan Sanders and Rebecca Long for leading our GIC team. But we're here to uh, celebrate what God is doing in our midst, and, and we're so blessed that God works through people, just regular people like you and me every day. And, 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 and we could not do, nor could our ministry partners or missionaries do without one another. Uh, and it just ties in with, with God's word, and we are all members of the body of Christ. Uh, members one of another. So I'd like for our ministry partners to stand, and I'm going to recognize them and try to call them by name, those who are here from our local ministry partners and, and uh, from the region. I know Howard's here. Howard, stand up. Howard Hines with our Methodist, Louisiana United Methodist Children's Home and Family Services. I don't see any other ministry. Oh, here, Stephanie, you were hiding behind Peggy. Stephanie Matthews with uh, Christian Community Action. Let's give it up for Stephanie. Wow. You, you were sneaking in on me. You were hiding right behind Peggy. And, uh, and thank you for being here and uh, for your faithfulness in our community. Stephanie, how many years have you been with CCA? 17, 17 of their 25 years. Is that right? 35 years they've been in ministry here, and uh, many of you are engaged and involved with, with their ministry, and thank you so much, Stephanie. And he, yeah, there we go, that's right. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to ask our missionaries to come forward, if they will, and introduce themselves. And there are, um, Joey's not with us, but Patty's here. Come on, Sammy. And uh, the Winkles are here with us. And... Um, reintroduce themselves come on up here and tell us who you are and uh, the field where you serve and Joey is not here so uh, Patty's here Joey's back in Ghana right now and uh, then we'll have a brief clip after this of the Datweilers who were not able to come they're in Ecuador they, Tim was here in October they're going to be back here in the fall but once a year for them to be away is difficult for them to be away from their ministry so we wanted to uh, uh, recognize them as well. Good morning. I'm Jason, and this is my wife, Felicia, with the Winkles. We have children interspersed around <laughs> the sanctuary. Um, we are serving in Memphis, uh, the international community, and also St. Jude families there. My name's Patty Romero, and uh, I'm serving in Ghana, West Africa. And um, I appreciate Bob because you know, when you're a married couple and my husband's not here, I'm still part of that ministry and we work just as hard sometimes as the men do on the field. So um, I go to many churches and they, they say, Joey the men is missionary, you know, and it's like, okay. <laughs> but you guys have always been wonderful and I appreciate y'all as a, a church family and uh, y'all have been so wonderful to us. Good morning, uh, my name is Sami Moremi and uh, my wife does send greetings. She's flying into DC right now. Um, but I serve among the Trukana people of Northwestern region of Kenya and thank you so much for all your prayers and your support. And, uh, but, and, and I, I mentioned Friday, and so Mary's returning from Africa right now, or she's been. And, and I mentioned Friday night, so some of you weren't here, but uh, the Ethiopian airliner that went down with 153, 157 were killed, including many Kenyans. Mary was waiting at the airport in Nairobi to board that aircraft on its next leg. 
So that's how fragile life is. Live every day for the Lord. Thanks. And we're going to catch a video from the Datweilers now. Get it to Welcome to Door of Hope for those children who are just coming down the hill get to come. This is the only place with open doors and green grass for the kids to play in this whole community. Welcome to my garden. This is my, my therapy but also my training ground to learn how to so extravagantly thank you so much grace for partnering with us for being a part of this ministry for sh since the beginning without you without god none of this could be possible thank you and god bless this time that you have exploring what god has for grace around the world and around the corner thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, who's ready to go to Ecuador? Woohoo! <laughs> Beautiful people, and you touch their lives every day. And and it it's a beautiful compound. Those were avocado trees in the background. Dana has a wonderful, beautiful garden. They raise a lot of what they eat there. Uh, fresh vegetables come out of the garden every day and go on their plates. Uh, but just outside, and you saw the children walking down that, that pathway, it is barren, it is rugged, it is, it is dirt poor, literally. And, uh, and you make a place, Puerta de Esperanza means door of hope, a place for those children. And, and the program starts on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m., those children are lined up outside when the sun is coming up, and then they come in the truck loads and bus loads, and, and that whole compound is full of children. And the, the young people that Dana and Tim are, are discipling, the young adults do study, Bible study on, uh, during the week, and then they lead the program on Saturday. So they're being discipled to make disciples. We're richly blessed. We're, him, uh, we're going to stand and uh, sing our hymn, Marching to Zion, number 733, a great missionary hymn.
To find our offertory prayer printed in your bulletins, we'll join together before we receive God's tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Lord, by the light of your Holy Spirit, inspire, equip, and embolden us as your people to be your servants and your witnesses, immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, a loving, supportive community, reaching out to those in need. Accept these gifts we offer and send your servants forth in great power. In Jesus' name, amen. Before Gary uh, offers our special music and uh, Joy comes, I wanted to say a word about our speaker for this weekend, but uh, also uh, I'm reminded this uh, little heart uh, reminds me of our theme to so love, and to so lo the love of God wherever we go and to so extravagantly. Uh, there are little hearts available in the foyer, in the entryway, and many people have already put their names on them and posted them on the uh, on the tree that's out there, it's going to be up for several weeks. Let this be one more indication of our commitment to be sowers of love and the love of God and the love of Jesus. So when you leave the sanctuary, uh, if you haven't done one of these, just write your name on it, put it up there, and let that be a, a moment for you to say visibly and outwardly, I'm committed and I'm giving the love of God that I've received to those in my life. Joy Griffin, uh, I got it right this time. I was calling her Joy Smith. I knew her as Joy Smith before she was married. We were seminary students. I was in my second year of seminary, and Joy was uh, beginning seminary. And we only had one class together. It was most in, it, one of the most significant moments in my life, and I know it impacted her life. We went to India together for three weeks, a little bit over three weeks, and uh, toured uh, all over India to 
see what God was doing in, in the cities and in the villages, and we were blessed to uh, be led by uh, J.T. Siemens, uh, who is a lifetime uh, missionary to uh, India, whose father uh, and, and family had served there for, for decades, an incredible ministry. I told a story about Joy and her uh, uh, energy in, in basketball. We, we'd been on the, the field for a couple of weeks and we we're tired and many of us dehydrated. Some were fighting uh, different forms of uh, illness and just general fatigue. And, and uh, there was a boys school that we toured, an athletic school uh, that had an all-star team and they challenged uh, a couple of our guys to play basketball and we just thought it'd be like a half court pickup game, we'd go up there. So we came back that afternoon and they had uniforms, they had uniformed referees, they had a pep rally going on with a thousand people in the stands or more it, and they were chanting and they were, and, and I said, whoa, they're serious about this. Uh, and Joy, because we, we were just a scraggly group of graduate students, uh, we didn't have talent like they had. We had a couple of guys that could really play. Joy had played ball in, in high school, and, uh, and she now knows that the lady texters are who we cheer for around here. I took her up to the TAC yesterday, and I, we stood in the glass. I said, you see that display case, national champions? Okay, we got that straight. So what I didn't tell about Joy, and I said it Friday night, she w we, didn't have, we didn't have tennis shoes or basketball shoes or anything. She showed up and played in sweatpants and a t-shirt in this right above the equator, probably over 100 degrees and, and very, very hot and dry out in the outdoor court, and she gave it all. And something I learned from Joy Smith, Joy Griffin, at the end of that trip, when we were waiting in the airport in Bombay, Joy didn't have any bags to pack, as I recall because she gave it all. She was going home with the clothes on her back. The sweatpants that she wore on Friday night probably had been washed. And the t-shirt that she wore on that, at that game, but everything else she left behind. And that was a learning moment for me to pack light, and it's just a good way to go through life, but also to leave it behind. She left it on the court on Friday, and when we flew out uh, a couple of weeks later, she left it behind. So now when I go on the mission field, I try to take things that I know others can use, and uh, and leave it behind. The most important thing that she's been all over the world and she leaves behind the word of God. She leaves behind disciples who have grown. She works in leadership development all over the world in countries, I don't know how many. And, uh, and she leaves behind the love of God and she will leave that here with us. So she's going to come after Gary offers special music, and I'm certain that you'll want to express your appreciation for her at, uh, at the close of the service today. So back in uh, 2003, uh, our church decided to undertake a study, the 40 Days of a Purpose Driven Life, which was uh, authored by Rick Warren from Saddleback Church, a small church. They had like 22,000 in attendance every year. But uh, he, uh, his father was, was a preacher for 50 years, and he, he was dying of cancer, and they were all at his deathbed. And within an hour before he passed, he became animated, whereas he had not been up until that point. And he kept saying, I've got to save one more for Jesus. He just kept saying it over and over, I've got to save one more. So they wrote this song with Rick Warren's father in mind, and it's called Each One Will Be Here.
Thank y'all. Beautiful. And a wonderful message in that song. Thank you. It's been such a privilege to be with y'all these days. Um, Bob and Evelyn told me the truth. Y'all are wonderful, and they love you, and I know you love them, and it's been a blessing to get to meet you and to be with them again, as well as um, missionaries that many have been friend with, friends with for a long time. So um, uh, thank you for your incredible hospitality here and for all the ministries that are going on. I'm so grateful for what you're doing here at Grace. This morning, I want us to look at a wonderful promise from God. It's in Romans chapter 10, and if you want to look in your Bible, it's verse 13. I'm just going to look at the three verses there, but 13 is a wonderful promise, and here's what God says. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yay, Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Yay. But then the next verse gets a little more negative. There's a question, and he says, but how can they call on him if they've never believed? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about Jesus? And how can they hear about him unless there's a preacher or a teacher? And how can there be a preacher unless they are sent by others? By sent, that means they're being prayed for, they're helping be supported to go out into the field. And then verse 15, I love. Here's what Isaiah. He says, for as it is written in the Old Testament, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of peace. How beautiful are the feet. So this morning, we're going to talk about our feet. So I want everybody to look at your feet. You can take your shoes off in church. Take them off. Yeah. No, I'm serious. Like, look at your feet, not mine. Look at your feet. And when you're taking off, do you think you have beautiful feet? Are y'all looking? No. Oh, first thing I heard somebody say, no. You know what? A lot of times when we take our feet out of our shoes, maybe they stink. So we think, oh, they're not very beautiful. Or um, maybe we have crooked toes. Or like me, I've got a hole in my sock stockings uh, today. I really didn't know that until I looked down. That's embarrassing. But anyway, but I want to tell you that Jesus says that your feet are beautiful if you're telling people about him, just like the song that was just sung. And that's true. And I want to say thank you. Thank you to Grace Church for having beautiful feet and sending your missionaries and supporting your mission partners right here, ministry partners right here in Ruston and, and, and Lincoln uh, parish as well as beyond. Um, I, I, when I think about who led me to Jesus, I want you to know they have beautiful feet because I'm going to be in heaven someday and not hell because of their feet and their willingness to share with me. So I want to say thank you for having beautiful feet, but I also want to remind us that, that all throughout the Bible, everywhere, God says he's looking for somebody. Remember we talked about Friday night. He's looking for just one, for somebody to help him carry the burden of a lost world. And if he can find that one person or that one church, the other people's circumstances will change. Now, God's looking for beautiful feet to tell others today because the majority, the big majority of God's world today is lost. Did you know that? And he needs feet to share about who his son Jesus is. Now, here's a question. We want to look at the world the way God looks at it today. So, who knows, who knows what the population of planet Earth is today, approximately? Seven billion. Somebody gets an A over here. That's right. That, the statistician people tell us seven billion people. Well, I want you to know this is what it looks like. About one-third of God's world, one-third, are believers like you and me. They're Christians. They're, they're in different countries, different cultures, different languages, different denominations. But they would say they're believers like us. So about two and a half billion people are Christians. Yay, that's wonderful. But then there's another third of God's world, a little over two billion people, who have had access to the gospel. That means that they have heard about Jesus. A having access means there's either all or part of God's word in their language, in their mother tongue that they could understand. There's a church, some kind of a church, somewhere in their sphere of influence, you know, like in their community or in in their parish, uh, some kind of a church that they could go and say, hey, who is this Jesus? And that there, or, or that there's a believer, a believer that they could go and say, hey, tell me who this God is or who Jesus is. So that, that means that they have access to the gospel. When somebody does not have access, they don't have any of those three things yet. And so um, that, that part of the world has had access. But for whatever reason, they've said, no, I'm not interested. And actually, probably a lot of those live in our neighborhood. Some of those are just right there. And, um, and I'm convicted. We need to get the word of Jesus to them and the love of Jesus that we're sowing. We need to be sowing into their hearts. But yet today, March 17th, is that the, what the day is? 
2019 and all of our beautiful places, our technology, all the things that we have in the world, I want you to know that one-third of God's world, a little over two billion people, have never, ever heard the name of Jesus. Not one time. They don't know there's a Christmas. They don't know there's an Easter that we're about to celebrate. The resurrection, yay, because we're going to get to go to heaven because we know about Jesus. They don't know about that. That's never, ever heard. And they're waiting for somebody to come and tell them. Now, I, my brain works better if I can kind of just see something. So this morning, I'm going to try to just, it won't be exactly even, but I'm going to try to divide us into thirds, okay? So let's see. Let's, this section here about, about to hear, okay? I don't know if that's even or not, but let's say all of you are going to represent the third of the world who are believers, so, okay, so when I say one, two, three, your response is, thank you, Jesus, because you're saved, okay? Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and that's good. Yeah, we're happy. We're thanking him. But y'all could be like shouting Methodists because you're going to heaven and not hell. Like, you could be excited, okay? You can do better. One, two, three. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, there you go. Woo! Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. Okay, now um, let's do this section. From here back on both sides, we're going to pretend that you represent the third of the world that's heard about Jesus, but you really are not interested, okay? So your response is, no thank you, Jesus, okay? One, two, three. Good. I mean, it's not good, but it's good that you were not real excited because the truth is you really don't care, right? That group. Okay, now from here up in the choir, you're going to represent the third of the world that's never, ever heard. So your response is, who is Jesus? Ready? One, two, three. Who is, Jesus? Who is he? So right now today, the way God sees his world, one third of his world is saying, thank, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Another third is saying, and another third is saying, who is he? Who is he? Now, the sad reality that in all this part of the world that's never heard of Jesus, do you know this? This disgusts me, really. It's so sad. All those people, it's possible for them to buy a Coca-Cola. Yeah, it is wow, yeah. So, I want to tell it's true. I mean, um, it, in all the places I've been, the farthest I've been in Turkana or far away in India, it's, it's possible. Now, they're not right there. They're not cold Coca-Colas, and there's not electricity, maybe. Um, it'd be a hot Coke. But you might have to walk a week or two, or you might have to ride a camel a few days, but it is possible to get to an old, rusted Coca-Cola bottle cap or to drink a Coca-Cola. Now, what's, what's convicting to me is Coca-Cola has done what Jesus said for us to do, to go into all the world. And so we are lying to ourselves and to others if we say it's not possible <laughs> because Coca-Cola has done it. And I'm not saying there's not some believers in the Coke company because I know there are, but I'm telling you, Coke did not do it for Jesus. Coke did it for the dollar, for the money. And, and you know, I actually... Um, uh, know somebody that was that's an executive at Coke that several years ago, about 20 now, years ago, I remember the billboards and the advertisement. They said they were in the meeting in Atlanta, the home of Coke, where, um, or the international headquarters are there, where the, the, big, the president was meeting with, with the executives, and, and they made the decision. Their uh, marketing strategy or their slogan was this, to put a Coca-Cola within arm's reach of every person on planet Earth. That was the goal. And they've done it. And I remember TV commercials and billboards with the arms stretched out and there would be a, looked like a frosty Coca-Cola there on, you know, for you to be reaching out to there. Now, as a Christian and as a missionary too, I, I think, I wonder what would have happened in that boardroom if the president had said, okay, boys and girls, now when every single person in Atlanta, Georgia drinks Coca-Cola and only Coke products, then we'll move out to the rest of the state of Georgia so people like Joy and uh, uh, Linda Winkle can have some Coca-Cola. And then when every single person in Georgia drinks Coke and only Coke products, then we'll move to the other 49 states so our friends over in Louisiana can have some Coke. And then when every single person in um, the United States, all 50 states, drinks Coke and only Coke, then we'll move to the rest of the world and let other people um, have some Coca-Cola. Where do you think Coke would be today if that's what he had said? Atlanta, Georgia. And I think in that room, I think there'd be people drinking Pepsi because they don't like Coke. That's okay. You know, the, whatever the other competition is. But, yeah, whatever, yeah. But, but, but instead, 
Coca-Cola did what Jesus said for us to do, like he said for us to be an Acts 1-8 church, like you are here, to, to be not just in Jerusalem and not just in Judea, not even just Samaria, but the ends of the earth. And, and Jesus needs our feet today because the majority of his world is lost. He needs beautiful feet to come and tell him. He needs beautiful feet at home when you go home today. He needs beautiful feet at school tomorrow. He needs beautiful feet on the ball field. He needs beautiful feet where you work tomorrow. And he needs beautiful feet around the globe on the other side of the world. Now, I want to tell you a story, a couple of stories of, of beautiful feet. And I know that you've been hearing many stories from missionaries and ministry partners this weekend. I actually was so blessed, Sammy. I was in um, Kenya and, um, and in Nairobi. And Ken, Sammy has told you he's Kikuyu tribe. The majority of folks there, I think, are pretty much Kikuyu. But I want to tell you, there were some brothers and sisters that got really convicted because as you've heard about the Turkana tribe, they're up in the northwest uh, corner of Kenya, right on the Ethiopia-South Sudan border there. It's very hot. It's desert. It's just like a 110, 120 degrees, like all the time. Even the camels are dying because the, the people are dying. Um, they need food. They're in famine and, and drought, and it's very difficult to get water. And so women especially walk very long distances to dig in the ground. Sometimes I've seen them dig in the ground and then pull up just maybe at what we would say a quart jar full of dirty water to then walk all those miles back um, to have it for their families. Um, it's just a difficult um, uh, terrain that's there. And it's, it's Muslim territory. So the people that were down in Nairobi um, at the time were really afraid of the Turkana. You know, they spear people. You've seen some of those spears on Sammy's um, uh, display there. I and mean, they really do. I mean, that, uh, I've had spears thrown at me. <laughs> so, so it's, it's um, um, a difficult part of the country. And so, so the people had just thought, well, they're just another tribe and we don't speak their language. But they actually, some Christians got convicted and said, we want to go. We feel Jesus is calling us and says we should go into all the world. So we should go and tell the Turkana about Jesus. So there were actually about 27 that were uh, most Kikuyu tribe that were willing to go to another tribe um, to share the gospel. And I was blessed to be able to go and, and teach. And so there was no electricity. I couldn't use pretty PowerPoint and things that we would like to use because there was none of that. We're just under a thatch roof. But we were, we were um, um, they were taking notes and I was teaching. About the middle of the week, they came to me and said, would you come and preach a crusade out, you know, for everybody to come, all the villages to come. And I said, well, um, what do you need? And they said, well, we want you to share your testimony for one thing. Remember, I shared a little bit about being healed the other night. And I said, okay. So at the end of the day on Wednesday, we gathered around and held hands and prayed. And I said, okay, I'm praying that when I give an invitation, just one, just somebody gets saved and that could help penetrate whoever their family is and, and other Turkana people. And I said, and if that happens, I want one of you to go and pray with them because I was having to be translated from English into Swahili into Turkana. And so if they went and prayed, it would just be Swahili in, into Turkana. So that would be a little bit easier. So, so we all prayed. And then we get to the place and hundreds of people came. Uh, some people just made a little makeshift platform and, and I don't know where they came from, but there were so many people there. And just as I'm walking up on the platform, a couple of little rickety steps to get up on the little stage, um, the, my translator was my only English. And my translator said, I need to tell you what's happened, Joy. I said, okay. He said, do you see over there? And it was really obvious. There was this huge, very angry-looking man screaming at the people. And he said, he's the mullah. He's the Muslim priest. And he's yelling at them saying, don't listen to her. This is war, and we're going to take her out. And so he said those words to me, but now I'm standing up in front of everybody, and so I couldn't even ask any other questions. You know, I'm just, I'm just there. And, and the very first flash, I've just confessed, the first flash in my mind is I thought, I might never see my children again on here on earth. It's possible. And then the next flash was about Mount Carmel. God brought me back in my brain to the book of Kings. Remember what happened there when the gods of Baal, of all the other idol worshipers, were, were fighting against our God, Elijah's God, the one true God. And, and I knew, of course, this was just spiritual battle. And I said, Lord, would you help me when I'm talking, just in my heart. I said, will you help me say Jesus? Because, you know, we teach and preach that there's power in the name of Jesus, don't we? We sing about it. And we, I believe it, but I'm just confessing to you. I don't know that I'd ever needed to appropriate it as much as I did in that moment. And I thought, a lot of these people are some that have never heard Jesus' name. So I thought, please help me. Instead of saying the Lord did this or God, say Jesus. And then if they do take me out, I'm gone, and that's fine. But they will have heard about Jesus just a little bit. So, believe it or not, 
I know y'all don't believe this, but I was talking really slow, like little, little baby sentences. I'm having to hurry today. I got a lot to tell you, so I need you to listen fast, okay? So, so I was doing baby sentences, and the translator was kicking in, and, and Jesus was really helping me. And it was like just talking to little babies. You're trying to be really, really simple. And guess what Jesus did? Just when I was about to give an invitation, out of the corner of my eye, I saw that the moolah guy walked away. I don't know where he went, but I was aware that he was moving, and I thought, yes, Jesus has a chance. I was so excited. So I gave an invitation, and not one came. But scores and scores and scores of people came. I mean, so many. They were just pushing like a riot, and I honestly thought they didn't understand. It was kind of mob mentality. You know, maybe they didn't know what what I had said, but, but they had. I mean, people were weeping and trying to grab people to pray for them. I mean, it was really precious. And I jumped down off the platform, and I only got to pray with my translator with one person, just one, only one, because he got ripped away. People were really grabbing, trying to get to whoever this Jesus is. I mean, it was just really sweet. So I was moving through the crowd. I didn't know what to do, so I just put my hands on two people at a time. I'm just praying for two at a time, moving through. And I was praying for him to be saved and healed, the disease, you know, there, not much medical help. And so I was just moving through, and then I was way in the back of the crowd, much further than the back of this sanctuary, when for me, it was a first. I experienced my first demon possession that I had ever seen. And I knew it was real, it was happening. This woman was banging herself in the dirt, foaming at the mouth, growling like an animal. I mean, it was just real. And the people around were still pushing forward. And, and I thought, oh, Jesus, what do I do? And do you know, God, and the reason I'm telling you this, I thought, I don't know if it'll ever happen to you, but had J.T. Siemens, our teacher, not told us about demon possession and dealing with that in India, I would have, I would have had no clue what to do. I mean, none whatsoever. But I just remember him talking about different times they were in ministry. He and his wife would be out and, and pleading the blood of Jesus over whoever it is. Because, of course, they don't say Jesus. The devil doesn't want them to say or call on Jesus. And so I just dropped down on, my, on the sand on my knees and just was pleading the, blood, the name of Jesus over this woman. And I don't know how much time happened, but I'm just here to tell you I got to witness Jesus deliver somebody. She came up clear as a bell, looking me straight in the eyes, saying, Keep Roy Yesu, glory to Jesus, trying to hug me. I mean, she was disheveled with dirt all over her hair, but, but God had delivered her. And, you know, later, my husband wasn't there. Uh, later, when the Africans told him what happened, he said, Now, Joy, you better go easy on this demon possession stuff when you talk in America, because people will think you're crazy. And I said, Well, you know what? That's out of the pit of hell, because I saw it. And God did it, and I think we need to know it and praise him for it. It's real. Okay, okay, so just as that's happening, okay, I'm going to learn something I learned this, use something I learned this week about your texters, okay? And y'all cheering for them. Okay, so I'm way back in the crowd, and back up at the little platform, here's what's happening. People are cheering, hooting and hollering like they're cheering for the texters. I mean, it's big. It's happy. And I can't tell what's happening, so I start moving my way back up. And guess what Jesus did? On that platform there, there was an old, tall, Turkana man walking up the steps by himself, walking onto the little platform. The reason the people were going nuts and cheering is because, guess what? He was a village blind man. He had been blind, completely blind, for 20 years, and God had just healed him. He's walking by himself, and they're cheering. So a young man got up on the platform, came over, and held his hand out. The old man who used to be blind could see, so he grabbed the guy's got hand. So the people cheered because they knew that meant he could see. Then the young guy walks over here. The, he holds up his hand. The older blind man reaches out and grabbed it, so it meant he could see. Uh, most of them cannot read and write, um, so, so they couldn't hold up a chart and say ABC, but they said point to, like point to Miss Mildred. He pointed to the right person, and so the crowd goes wild. And so I was able to get back up there, and I said, it's that Jesus I was talking about that wants to live in your heart that loves this man that's just healed him. And the God of Islam is empty. It's sterile. It does not produce. But our God is the strong one. And do you know what happened? I don't know if this has happened with you there, Sammy, before or not, but I thought this was so biblical, although I'm not sure they knew that it was. The people didn't ask permission. Like, they didn't wait until tomorrow. They went to their huts right then, like then, and got everybody they knew that was sick, that was crippled or blind or lame, something wrong with them, and brought them back for us to pray for and expecting this Jesus to, to heal their people. And so, actually for me, and we did pray, and I actually saw more signs and wonders than I've ever seen, ever, all, all that night. 
And I really believe it's just because God wants and needs a witness there. But today, the old man that used to be blind is working out in the village. He has beautiful feet for Jesus with other people. Isn't that a great witness? But I think maybe the reason all that happened is because those 27 were willing to go out of their language, their culture, their dialect, and into a, maybe a foreign place for them that was uncomfortable and maybe dangerous and scary for them. But they were willing to go and have beautiful feet to, to try to tell those about Jesus. And today, there's going to, tomorrow, in, in heaven, there are going to be an awful lot of Turkana people there because of their willingness and because of your ministry here um, at Grace. And let's go to another part of the world, actually China. We've got our China missionaries here. And so I know I was in a different part of China than where they've been ministering. But the opportunity came um, several years ago. We've been praying and praying to be able to get into communist China with leadership training. And, and most of you uh, know this better than me. Some of you remember this. In 19, just the history is in 1949 is when um, Mao, uh, Chairman Mao, they call him, came uh, into power and formed the People's Republic of China. And so Christian um, uh, missionaries and witness were expelled, you know, from the, from the country. And so um, now you get to know, hear from your missionaries, but the Spirit of God has been moving like crazy, and we praise him for that. And even though there's been great, horrible persecution to the Chinese Christians, the Spirit has been moving, and now Jesus has multiplied believers there. And so we were, we were wanting to be able to get in. But, but there, uh, because of communism um, uh, and the fear of that, it could be that you, you've got to, you need to see people face to face. Like the people we were dealing with, even if you had been emailing to them or writing to them for years, maybe even on the telephone, it could be that after 10 years, if Evelyn and I have been writing, what if she turns me in? or I turn her in, I'm a bad guy. And then not just Evelyn, not just her precious family, not just her church family, the entire network, everybody you know that's a Christian that you've ever kind of known, the network gets wiped out. And so that was their fear. And um, so my goal was to get in and meet person to person, face to face with some of the underground church leaders. And they could know that I was real and legitimate and that stuff. So, so the government of China thought I was coming to backpack on the Great Wall of China as a tourist, and I did. I had to do that in order then to meet with the people at the end. But um, in order to get in, I had to sign a piece of paper that promised that I would not talk, talk about any religions or any governments. And then there was this long few paragraphs saying, if you do, trying to scare you, if you do, you'll be um, uh, arrested, imprisoned, tortured, killed, you know, like all that can happen. So they're trying to, you know, really make you afraid. But I signed that because I was trying to get in. And so every day I really did backpack we crawl through the on our bellies uh, in the forest through you know the old mountainous part up to the crumbled parts of the wall and then down and then every night slept on a little farmer's uh, pasture or cornfield you know just moving along and at the end I was able to make the connections praise Jesus and so so now we've got ministry going on there but what I want to tell you is I was on my way back to the airport and I'm in a taxi and I'm by myself with this driver, and um, I asked if he could do a little English, and he could, just a little broken English, better than most. And I said, tell me your name. And he said, my name is Ping, P-I-N-G. So I want you to remember Ping, okay? Like ping pong, Ping. And, um, and so I said, um, Ping, tell me about you. And he didn't talk a lot. And then I thought, I would really like to witness to Ping because he's probably part, this part of the world that's not heard about Jesus. But I thought, what if Ping is a bad guy? And if I say something about Jesus or God, then he turns me in. Maybe I don't see my children and husband again, you know? And um, so I was saying, God, help me. So the Lord did help. And I said, Ping, what do you believe? So I've not said anything, you know, like Christian yet. And he said, nothing. I don't believe anything. So that didn't help me. Then I'm getting closer. And I thought, oh, God, hurry. Jesus, help me. So I said, Ping, what do you believe is going to happen to you when you die? And immediately he answered. He said, oh, the government tells all the Chinese that all Chinese go to the fire. The government tells us that all Chinese go to the fire when we die. And I said, oh, Ping, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to your government or to anybody, but I want to tell you God loves us so much, and he's made it possible that you and I don't have to go to the fire. His eyes got big, and I said, and he loves us, and he says that if we search for him with all our heart, we'll find him. He said, okay, well, that, yeah, that's good. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. And he said, okay, sure, sure, you know, thank you, that's good. Then, then um, I said, Ping, I'm going to go. Oh, I said, he, he, he sent his son Jesus, never heard of Jesus. It's totally foreign to him, never heard of it. I said, and he wrote it down in a big book, like a big love letter, how much he loves us. And 
never heard of the Bible. So I said, Ping, I'm going to go back to my country, and I'm going to get this book in your language and send it to you. And he held his hand out. He stopped me. He said, no, it'll never get to me. The government stops at everything. I said, well, I'm going to pray that this book's going to get to you. And I said, when you get it, read all of it. But then I took out a piece of paper, and I wrote down the plan of salvation, some from the New Testament, the Gospels, John, and then Romans. And I said, read these verses first. He said, she, she, stuck in his back pocket. But then we're at the airport. The officials are around. We can't talk anymore because he prayed. So um, I did come back to the States. I ordered a Mandarin Bible that came. And then I got a big box, and I stuck it in the bottom of the box. And um, then I went through our house and literally just got trash, old newspapers. I filled the box full, um, hoping that the officials would look in and it wasn't important and they would let it go. And then I did what I thought was brilliant. My husband thought I was crazy, but in the end it actually worked. I went to the local Chinese restaurant and asked them to, to label everything so it would look really Chinesey, you know? Like, because I don't know how to do that, and I needed it to look official, and so they did. So there was no English, you know, went, and then I mailed it and prayed. And so weeks passed and even some months, and I was praying for Ping and for it to get there, and guess what Jesus did? It was actually in February. A letter came, just no return, anything. It was all sort of in code, but here's what it said, exact words. It said, Dear Joy, I received the package. I'm reading the book with great interest. I have many questions. Thank you, Ping. Yes, it's yay. Do you know, do you know what? Yay, Jesus. But here's what my prayer has been. I've prayed that God would send somebody with beautiful feet into that taxi that can help connect him to a fellowship. And, of course, for the Holy Spirit to reveal himself through his word. But what Ping reminds me of is millions of Chinese that have never heard. And he reminds me of millions of people all over the globe that have not heard and not accepted Jesus. And so I was thinking, how many Pings are right here in Lincoln Parish? You know of some, probably just down the street or across the road. People that maybe, maybe they've heard about Jesus, but they need beautiful feet to share and sow this love into them so that they get to the point that they really want to say, not no thank you, Jesus, but yes, thank you, Jesus. So that's what today's all about. That's what this weekend's been about. It's about big business. Remember we talked about the biggest business, the most important and significant business. It's eternal business. And I want to say thank you because the offering that you're taking this morning is going to help mobilize the many ministries and missionaries that you support. So the question today, I want you to not panic. I want you to know the question today is not about cash. It's not about anything you've got in your pocketbook or wallet. It's about faith. And it's not about the church budget, so don't panic on that. This is, has nothing to do with the budget. It's about what you and I can trust God for over the next year, the next 12 months for missions. So here's, here's um, I just want to explain in case some people might not know really quickly, how do you do faith promise? That's the question. Here's the answer. Three things. First, you pray and ask God how much you should trust him for, because if he doesn't provide the money, you, you, don't have to, you don't give it. Two is you write that amount down on a faith promise commitment card. So I want to see your cards. Does everybody have a card? You should have gotten a card in your bulletin. I want to see them. Hold them up. I want everybody, every person here, not like for a family, everybody needs a card. So if you don't, the ushers are going to come and give you a card. Hold up your hand now if you don't have a card. If you do not, everybody, the youngest, the oldest, needs a card. Okay, and you're going to pray, and then you're going to write down on that card how much Jesus says that he thinks that you, you can trust him for. And then third is you give throughout the year as God provides. Again, if he doesn't provide, you're not responsible. God's the one that's liable there. Now, let me tell you how may, God may provide. Normally, normally it's one of three ways. It could be different, but usually it's one of three, and I'm going to tell you about them. The first is miraculously, like some miraculous provision. It's like he, um, he provides something you don't expect. He provides income that was not in. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, everybody needs a card. Not anticipated. For example, maybe, maybe an Aunt Sally somewhere, a great aunt that you didn't even know, maybe left money to you, maybe some inheritance. I can tell you my first experience, and it made a believer out of me, David Siemens was preaching about faith promise in the Wilmore Church when Bob and I were students there in Evelyn. And do you know, I grew up in Methodist Church all my life, but I'd never heard of faith promise. And so David Siemens was preaching. And I was a student, didn't have money to even be there. I was having to work my way through. And, and so I wrote on a card. Nobody saw it but me and Jesus. I wrote an amount down, and I thought, God, I don't know how you would do this. The very next morning, on Monday morning, we went to, I went to my little seminary post office box. It's just a little, a little hole in the wall. And there was an envelope, and my name was typed, Joy Smith, nothing else. Inside was a plain blank 
white piece of typing paper and inside cash for the exact amount that I had written on that card. That's a miraculous provision. And he may not do it that way, but God did that time for me. The second way is projects. Like you might do a yard sale or a craft sale or a car wash or you say, I'm going to work for a day and use that money for my faith promise. Another way, or something else, you be creative and think of. The last way is disciplined giving. You determine a certain, to give a certain amount today, and then maybe you give up soft drinks one day a week. Or your family gives up going out to eat for a meal uh, one day a month or something. Um, or, or you just decide. I want to tell you a story about a little woman named Elizabeth Gardner that's way in her 90s now. She lives in Tennessee. Her husband went to heaven several years ago, and she's on a really fixed income. But precious Elizabeth has a mason jar on her little kitchen table, and every day she puts $1 in that mason jar. So she knows her faith promise is going to be at least 365 I want to tell you, you're not too old, you're not too young, ever. The smallest amount I've ever seen on one of these cards was written in crayon, and it was $3.46. The most I've ever seen written on a card was $50,000. And there's people here that could do that, and I know that. But, it, it, but whatever God tells you to give, no matter how, what he tells you, he's going to provide and he'll be faithful. And it's going to be so exciting to see how he provides because he'll honor his word to you. So today, I'm not begging you to give a certain amount, but I am begging you to listen to Jesus and be obedient to him and um, surrender your availability. Remember, he's just looking for one that says, Jesus, I am available to you like Isaiah did. Remember, he said, here I am. You can send me. I love another place in the Bible about little Mary. Jesus' mother. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, when the angel came to her and said, you're going to be the mother of God's son, here's what Mary said. She said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your will. She was just saying, God, I'm available. And that's all he really wants from us. So say, here I am, Jesus. You can have my life and you can have my pocketbook. So our brother Bob is going to come now and direct us into um, the next few minutes. Ask Jesus how he wants to use your feet. Your feet to be beautiful uh, personally, as well as how to help other ministry partners use their feet. Oh, I should take my shoes. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Thank you, Joy. You've heard God's word. You've heard witness and testimony to God's hand in this world. There is no greater call. There is no greater privilege to be a part of of what God is doing in this world for those who say what Jesus for those who say no thank you Jesus and it's done by those who say thank you Jesus we're going to have a few moments Sherry's going to sing uh, a song you'll have some time hopefully God has spoken to you Ask God to speak to you, as Joy said, the first step is prayer. This is over and above giving. This is beyond what we can see. But we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith in the one who owns all things, the cattle on a thousand hills, and holds all things, including our lives, in his hands. The call of the hour, the urgent, urgent call of the hour in the moment is upon us. You'll see one side of the card is for our faith promise commitment. The other side of the card is for our life commitment, perhaps to serve locally, perhaps to show an interest in um, serving around the country somewhere or to go and to go and to love on people in the name of Jesus to a foreign land. At the bottom of the life commitment card side is uh, an invitation. I believe God is calling me to full-time Christian ministry. I believe God may be calling me to be a missionary. I desire to receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. If that's your desire, any one of those three you indicate there. As you bring the cards forward after Sherry has sung, Kathy will be playing after Sherry has, uh, has sung a, a piece for us. A piece for us to uh, have time to hear God's word speak to us and hear God's voice speak to us individually. And then as Kathy plays, you may bring the cards forward. If you desire to spend time in prayer, we'll be here to pray with you. And perhaps you've never heard 
the call of Christ on your life as you're hearing this morning to service locally, to service internationally, to ser lifetime service, or to come and to give your life to Christ and receive him today. You come forward and we'll be here to pray with you. Thank you. 